All right, everybody, you made it to your last anatomy le lecture, so woot woot, enjoy. Um, so kind of big ideas for this one. We're going to try and cover a uh, kind of big idea here is aesthetic evolution and how that's different from ad adaptive evolution. Um, we'll look at female autonomy and how that has shaped basically all life on Earth. So autonomy is referring to like female independence and especially in regards to like mate choice. So being able to choose your mates. Uh, and then we'll kind of cover a little bit of Masters and Johnson. They were like the first pioneers in actual like sexual science. Science. Um, so actually like legit the science behind it. So there's a lot of psychology and physiology that they go into. Uh, and then we'll look at um, some non-reproductive behaviors. Um, so traits um, that can, can we explain um, maybe traits like homosexuality where you think, oh, you know, how, how could this trait persist if it's not necessarily, you know, um, advantageous to reproduction, right? Um, so not that, you know, maybe, uh, people uh, that are homosexuals need to have their behavior explained, right? Um, but since, you know, we're kind of the world we're living in, um, we'll, we'll, we'll let science give a crack at it, um, and maybe that'll help maybe uh, engender some uh, some more thoughtfulness and compassion on how people will treat uh, the LGBTQ plus community um, and uh, maybe a little more understanding, hopefully. All right, so speaking of... If you guys haven't checked out um, Native Ideas of Two-Spirit, check that out. Pretty interesting. Um, so let's jump into adaptive and aesthetic evolution here. So I'm actually going to skip a slide ahead first. I'm going to talk about basically who came up with, you know, natural selection. So I hope you guys remember, it was Darwin from biology class. But there's also this guy, Wallace. They kind of came up with the ideas at the same time. Uh, Darwin ended up kind of publishing his first um, with the origin of species and getting his ideas out there. Um, but they um, obviously, you know, natural selection is this idea that, you know, you can explain every trait out there. Um, and they all these traits have adapted and developed over time to be beneficial to, like, a creature's fitness. And so how that, you know, adaptation, especially like corresponds with like the environment they're in. Um, and so that's what they kind of both agreed on. However, Darwin also proposed this idea of sexual selection and that, you know, there are some traits out there that, you know, just don't really fit into this idea of, oh, it's actually, it's, it's beneficial for survival and reproduction. Um, so there, there's, there was a lot of stuff that, you know, what we call normal natural selection or just adaptive uh, selection or evolution just really can't explain or can't explain very well. So, for example, if we go back, there's lots of birds out here who have, like, features, like, feathers that are, like, way too long for, like, opt optimum flight. So, why would they why would they grow? Why would they evolve to have, like, too long feathers? It actually slows them down and makes them more susceptible to prey, right? Um, there's, uh, well, moose have got it pretty uh, handy, but there's the Irish elk example where uh, the females just like really big racks and we think part of the reason the Irish elk went extinct is because just their their racks got way too big and instead of actually helping protect them from like wolves and predators it actually like lowered their head down and was like too hard to handle and actually made it easier to be killed um, same with like you know other creatures that have really bright extravagant mating displays right not only is that like for attracting females but it attracts like predators right you're on the ground you're making a lot of noise like that is you know, why would this evolve? You know, natural selection or at least adaptive evolution doesn't really explain why these traits uh, occur. But this idea of aesthetic evolution, the fact that, oh, organisms have their own subjective idea of what they like, especially um, in regards to like, you know, usually it's females choosing the mates. Um, not always, but usually. Um, and so if females are selecting like, oh, I only want to mate with the males with the longer tails, right? So it's it's going to push, they're, they're kind of, they can be at times opposing ideas. This idea of pushing for a longer tail versus natural selection says, hey, it should really only be like this long, not that long, but it's, it's this female push. So uh, Darwin would say sexual selection is this unique mechanism Sometimes it correlates with adaptive evolution, whereas Wallace and everyone after him was said, oh, well, you know, these ideas, if the tail's longer, th there's got to be a reason why. If they're doing these mating displays, there's got to be a reason why as far as, like, 
personal fitness or fitness of the offspring or even the female. Um, and it, it's not just due to this kind of subjective idea of the female saying, hey, I like this, so I'm selecting for that. Um, so it's kind of like earth shattering. And that's why Darwin's idea kind of got, you know, shoved under the rug and he died off first. Wallace promoted his idea and sexual selection kind of got incorporated into adaptive selection pretty much till like today. Uh, we, we've really kind of started going back and looking at Darwin's ideas to, to change us around. Um, so this idea that, you know, organisms have their own subjective opinion or their own idea of what beauty is. Um, so there's a really cool book I'll show you guys later. It's called Beauty Happens. Um, you know, that organisms have their own idea of beauty and it's not always in line with what we think of as like what is, what is really great with adaptive selection. So who? That was a whole lot to get into. So let's look at some more examples. Here's the great Argus. Um, this is actually, this bird is at uh, Minneapolis Zoo. Um, look at like the complexity of every one of these features, right? Adaptive evolution should be able to say, oh, there's a reason why like, you know, the feather is this big. There's this many number of uh, circles. Like the, the bird, that's the male's eye right here is poking out and looking at her. There's a reason why it's displayed in this manner. And, and there's really like, you know, we just can't find data to support adaptive evolution for everything, right? What's more likely is, oh, just aesthetic evolution. The female has selected for these extravagant displays, these extravagant features over time. They kind of call it like the runaway train hypothesis that, you know, all right, if she likes this one thing, that means she's kind of got like choosy genes. And then the male has these like uh, these traits right here, right? And so their offspring would also have these traits and her choosy dreams, right? So whether they're male or female, the kids, they're going to keep selecting and keep pushing for more and more extremes of these traits. So that's what this kind of runaway hypothesis is. Same idea with like the longer and longer tails and like the more extravagant mating displays, which, um, you know, isn't always like, you know, what we think of a normal adaptive evolution, whereas, you know, the cheetah just got faster and faster because its prey was getting faster and faster, right? So this was an arms race. These these traits for like mating displays or what we call sexual ornaments, ornamentation to kind of entice a mate is really being played across by just this idea of what this female thought was pleasurable or beautiful, which is, whoa, crazy to think of. And so here's some more mating displays, right? Here's this kind of cool uh, moonwalking bird. It's a white throated mannequin. Uh, Here's another example of aesthetic evolution kind of working backwards. There's, this is a club wing warbler and its wings are actually like way too short. It can still fly, but it flies pretty terribly. Um, but what it has evolved to do, why it evolved this way is because females like the noise it can make with its wings. And so click on this link. You're going to listen to the noise. It's really crazy. It's not making the noise with its mouth. It's making it with its wings kind of like crickets do, which is like amazing. It's like a super high print, uh, pitch and frequency, but it has lowered its fitness as far as flying, catching prey, avoiding predators. So that's another kind of like backwards things. And then check out this. We'll try also to explain how look at these all these males cooperating this behavior usually we see intense male competition now we see these males working together and what's even crazy is usually it's just the one male that will end up mating with the female uh, for like almost all of these uh, um, scenarios it's just the one so like the other three or four males are just kind of there helping out which is like a really weird strange thing to think about especially in regards to comparing adaptive versus aesthetic evolution. Um, so watch this video if you guys want to. It's, a, it's pretty fun. But these are, these are some optional ones. All right, so now start, let's start looking at kind of human traits in regards to like aesthetic evolution versus adaptive evolution. Um, and so you've kind of seen some of these videos already. Um, so when we talk about like human sexual ornamentation, right, we actually do have some ornaments. So like we believe like testes, like the, the dangling of the testes, penis size would be ornaments, um, permanent breast tissue, which is actually unique in humans. Most like all other species, um, will develop it only during like that reproductive period or like when it's necessary, not just like, you know, a, like from maturity onwards, uh, where body fat is distributed, you know, in the buttocks, the whole hourglass shape or idea. Um, and then some other, um, ones would be like, um, where body hair is distributed, right? In certain regions, like why are they there and not in other places? Um, so things to think about. 
Now we're going to look at primates because they're our closest kind of living relatives and you know we obviously can't look at like other hominids because they've all gone extinct kind of like Neanderthals or Homo erectus, um, uh, Homo habilis. Um, so we're going to try and look at especially chimpanzees and bonobos, um, their, their traits. But what we do see is yeah this, this increase in penis size right where the primates with the largest penis like even um, compared to like uh, body size when you correct for that that's still the biggest um, and we also have um, kind of in between testes size where um, and we'll talk about this with chimpanzees chimpanzees have really big testes compared to ours gorillas and uh, orangutans have really small testes um, so we'll talk about sperm competition stuff like that too so looking at like human uh, traits, what adaptive evolutions would, uh, evolutions would say is that, all right, there's, there's got to be some value for that trait beyond just sexual attraction. Like, you know, penis size must correlate with getting a female pregnant or something like that. Um, like sexual attraction, it's, it's not just arbitrary. There's, there's like a reason, even if we don't consciously know the reason for it, um, why um, hourglass shape versus, um, you know, dangling testes or not, what, what is important for that. So adaptive evolutions kind of sum it up would say, okay, sexual attractiveness has an encoded meaning, and so like the more quote-unquote beautiful an individual is, that would make them objectively superior in terms of like fitness, in terms of genes or something like that, which, you know, you probably already have alarm bells ringing in your head, like there's something about that that just doesn't seem right. And so when we've done like studies on these traits, like, oh, does the hourglass body shape have anything to do with fertility? It, it really doesn't. We, we haven't found any evidence of that. We've, we had some studies where that kind of like suggested it, but they, they actually said the opposite of it. So there, there is no really um, a correlation between hourglass shape and like how fertile the woman is and how well the children do. Um, so like very little data supports all these ideas. And we'll go over a few of the other ones uh, as well. What an aesthetic evolution would say is that these sexual ornaments or ornaments are pretty much arbitrary and don't really indicate quality or health of the person um, in general now sometimes they do sometimes they do overlap um, and so some of them might be an honest indicator so like for these house finches right um, this the brighter the, the the red the more actually healthier they are um, so that would be actually an honest indicator of oh this is this is good um, uh, bird, but is that its genetics or is that just, oh, it had better access to food, so it was better able to create these, uh, the pigmentation in its feathers? So, you know, kind of gets a little tricky there. So what I kind of want to highlight here is, um, you know, this idea of these sexual ornaments being arbitrary doesn't stop them from fitting in the idea of also being an honest indicator. What it does is it doesn't for the, force them to fit this idea with like no evidence. So it's not like kind of pushing a square and like a, a circular hole. Um, you know, mating value isn't universal or objective. It's, it's very much subjective. Like the female is picking certain traits. Even think of just songs. Why do they like certain songs? over other songs, right? Um, how did that develop and diversify over time within like a, a um, closely related group of species, right? Um, so it's very much just a subjective thing. So sticking with primates here, if we kind of look at primates, kind of how they live and reproduce, gorillas, um, they live in areas where there's like one male and it dominates several females. They have a very large sexual dimorphism. Dimorphism basically means kind of like two shapes. So like the male is like greatly different from the female, um, especially in, in this case, size wise. Um, and like chips, they aren't interested in sex except during this very like specific period called estrus, which is different than menstruation, but you get the idea. It's basically when like obvious is occurring for like the gorilla females. Chips live in larger groups or troops um, and there is an alpha but there's like a mixture of males and females whereas here there'd just be like one like silverback gorilla like one like ultimate male um, and because of this since they are always competing with each other's the males that's why they have the larger testes because that kind of correlates with the higher sperm count so they actually have way more sperm in their ejaculate than humans do like if you um, looked at our sperm and their sperm and didn't know which is which you'd think oh maybe the chip and Z is like very infertile, but no, they have a super high sperm counts. Um, they do have occasions where like males and females will like partner off and like kind of leave the troop and like procreate during estrus. But for the most part, it's, it's usually just the alpha male that has to fight for the other ones. But, but these women we'll talk about in a second women, the female chimps, um, will actually, um, mate with a lot of males and we'll talk about why in a second so like high promiscuity which we actually we see that's that's pretty normal in nature 
Now, why they are very uh, promiscuous is because, check out this number for infanticide, about 33% of all infant deaths are because uh, when the new males are like fighting for each other, if a new alpha male comes in, he's going to kill off the babies of all the females, which is going to trigger the woman or the female chimp to go into uh, ovulation and estrus again. So it's basically opening up mating opportunities for that new alpha male, which is like pretty messed up, right? So it's a very patriarchal society. Chimps and gorillas are very much dominating the females, and there's not a lot of what we would call female autonomy, female choice and mating for the most part. We're going to pick back up with bonobos, which are going to be a little bit different. You can already see this matriarchal group.